Dr. Scott's going to be talking to us about data collection methods, and then the feedback that we were getting from everybody was what you'd really like to do is be able to start bringing information on your own kids, all work together, have some input from Dr. Scott, have him help facilitate that. So that's kind of the plan for today, data collection and then looking at, at our own kids. And, and as we go through this, that's what we're going to start to do more of. Thank you. OK, good morning. Um, like Sherry said, what I want to talk about today is simple ways to follow what kids are doing in a classroom setting. And I want to really focus on this word, simple. Um, data collection is always a scary thing. And when I go into schools and mention the words data and collection in the same sentence, people usually run screaming. I don't know what they picture exactly. I, I have this feeling that they picture that you need to wear safety glasses and a lab coat or something because they're collecting data. And what I like to try to get to with people is data collection is just teaching. If you're teaching math, you need to know, does the kid get it? <clears throat> if you're teaching social skills, you need to know, is the kid doing it? <clears throat> if you want the, the child to sit down more often, you need to know, are they sitting down more often? And I don't think we would ever accept it from a teacher to say, well, I don't ever formally do any assessments with math, but it seems like they're doing OK. And I don't think we should accept that for behavior either. Plus, the research that's out there says we are not very good judges about changes in behavior over short periods of time. In other words, a behavior that was a problem, even though it may have changed significantly, is still a problem. And so when you ask people, is it getting better, they say no even though it may have actually gotten quite a bit better, which says we should keep going with that plan. So we really need to have some objective way of saying this is happening more or less. Just like if we were teaching math, we'd want to say they used to be able to get 80%, now they get 90%. That's important. Just to say it seems like they're doing okay doesn't tell me very much. So what I'd like to do is spend about an hour just talking about a variety of methods for collecting different kinds of behavior information with the key being on what would be simple. <clears throat> Much of what we do in data collection depends on what we want to know. And what we want to know often is connected to where the kids are on a learning curve. So just to review learning curve if you're not familiar with it, what the learning curve does is it says the typical kid, no, the typical organism learning a new behavior, whether that's kid, adult, animal, whatever, the curve looks the same no matter who we are, no matter what we teach. When we first teach, we don't get a bunch of progress. It's slow going trying to get somebody to learn how to do it. However, what you do notice, if you were to plot this on an equal interval rather than equal, or an equal ratio rather than interval, so that the difference between 10 and 100 is the same as the difference between 100 and 1,000, this is actually a pretty straight line. In other words, these kids go from 1 to 2. It doesn't look very good, but it's double. And they go from 2 to 4. It doesn't look real good, but it's double. So they're learning, but it doesn't show up real big on our graph. We call that part acquisition. After acquisition, what we want is, OK, you know what it is. Can you do it fluently? Can you do it efficiently? Can you do it just like that? I say do it, you just do it. So let's say we're teaching a kid to draw a, a human figure. When we first start teaching it, there's lines all over the paper. And you could look at that and say, where's the man? But eventually, they get something that looks like a man. And then what we want is that we say, draw the man, and they draw the man. They don't have to stop and think about it and, and do this whole practice over again. They've got it. They can do it quickly. We call that fluency. We want you to be fluent. So when we're measuring fluency, what we're interested in knowing is, is the kid doing a bunch of it? Are they doing a lot of that? Once they're fluent, what we want to know is, can they continue to do this 
if we don't do it for a day or two? Can they remember it? And we call that maintenance. When we're interested in measurement at the maintenance issue, what we're saying is, can this kid remember to do something? So when we, if we do a review, will they get the right answer on the review? Do they remember it? Beyond acquisition, fluency, and maintenance are the things that go out into the real world. If I know that a kid has the skill down, they get it. They can do it quickly, and they can remember it. Then the next thing I want to know is, can they do it when I'm not here? Could they do it out in the community? Could they do it with other people? Could they do it with slightly different circumstances? And we train for that, and we can measure it. Can kids answer math problems in story problem format? There's a generalization. If a kid can say two plus two all day long equals four, but anytime they go out in the real world and see two and two, and we ask them how much that is total and they have no idea, we have no generalization, it isn't gonna be a very successful skill. The last thing that we want is something we really can't teach. <clears throat> it's called adaptation. Or you might call this creativity. If I'm really good with understanding it, I can do it quickly, I remember it, I can use it everywhere else, then kids generalize it. So our kids that were drawing stick figures and can do it quickly and can remember it and can draw them in other places begin to find other ways to make that stick figure look like a man or woman. But you can't be creative with a skill that you don't have. So the way we teach is get them to get it. Then get them to be fluent with it. Hope they remember it. Get them to use it somewhere else and then let them be creative. So when we start measuring, a lot of times what people want to do when we talk about what's that kid doing is they want to go to these big kind of abstract ideas, which will be great if we already know that all of these things are in place. So where we need to begin is, how do we know that those basic things are there? And we're going to talk about behaviors. We're going to leave the context of math and reading and the other kinds of things that we typically measure in schools. And let's go right to just behavior. And I want to talk about two basic ways to collect behavior that are really simple. There is a multitude of different ways under each. One is called event-based recording. We are all familiar with this. Event-based recording says, if you're looking for a kid to have a particular behavior, you have to keep your eyes open and watch them. And when they do it, you have to make some sort of a record that that happened. That's what we all do. There's another kind called time-based recording, which says, let a clock be what dictates whether you collect data or not. That kid's done that behavior a million times and you never recorded anything. When do you record? When the clock runs out of time. So there are these little wristwatch type things that vibrate. And you wear them on your wrist and you set the timer on it. And you say, set the timer for 15 minutes. And you're just teaching and doing what you normally do and then that thing vibrates at the end of 15 minutes. You make a mark somewhere, did the behavior happen or not happen during that time? It could happen 50 million times. You don't do anything until that thing vibrates. We're going to talk about a couple of ways to do time-based using the clock on the wall in your room, those kinds of things. So we've got to keep it simple. There are a couple of ways that could happen. Is this, this is yeah. not for the camera, though? Oh, okay. No, I mean, this one is not for the camera. Okay. Right. Oh, right. Okay, I don't need that one, I don't think. Thank you, though. With all of these, what we need to start with is, what are we looking at? What are we watching? What I like to do when I, when I teach my graduate students about this is I have a couple of videos of kids in classrooms. And they're doing a variety of things. And I'll just put the video up and I'll say to everybody without giving them any other prompts, I want you to watch this kid and tell him if he's on task. And so I, sh I start the video and they all watch the video and they're you know, looking at it and paying attention and kind of laughing and then it's over and I say, okay, was the kid on task? And they go, kinda, sometimes, a little bit, 
And I said, if you went to an IEP meeting and it was about your child and, and you asked, how's my child doing? And they said, well, kinda, sorta, a little bit. Would you be very happy with that? They said, well, no, we didn't know what you wanted us to do. No, I told you I wanted you to say, are they on task? In order to know if they're on task, we need to know, what do you mean by on task? So the first thing we have to have to do, no matter what we're going to do with re recording, is define the behavior you want to know about. In terms that are absolutely concrete, observable, measurable, concrete. Second, figure out when and where you're going to observe. If you have a child whose problems occur every day during independent work time, should we watch this kid all day long every day? Don't. Watch them during the times when it's a problem. So data collection needn't be something that happens all day everywhere. Now if you say this kid fights with everyone all over the school, you've just defined watching this kid everywhere all over the school. But if you say this is a problem during math, then you only do this during, this is a problem during independent work time, then you only need to watch it there. So we want to define when we're going to measure, and let's only measure when we need to. That will make it simpler. <clears throat> Third, if you're using time-based, we're going to have to talk about interval size. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, figure out which of the things you're going to use. We're going to get to that. And we want to be able to convert whatever comes out of that into something that's really easy to talk about. So we're going to do that. So let's go through and look at these. There are five types of event-based. You probably have heard or seen most of these. I just want to go through and give you a quick little demonstration of what we're talking about on each one. The first one's called tally or frequency. For instance, we could use it here. Staff and students alike are complaining that Jimmy is crying too much on the playground. So Principal Meany wants to know, just how many crying episodes does Jimmy have in a day? What do we want to know? We just simply want to know how many times did this happen. And the way we do that is, we count it. There's one. There's one. There's one. Now what if Jimmy isn't on the playground where we can stand there and go, there's one, but what if Jimmy's in your classroom and it's during reading instruction that he's having a problem? You're not going to stop reading instruction and go, there's one. It's probably even hard for you to pull out a piece of paper and write down, there's one. But you could have a tally sheet and make little tally marks and when you got to four you could cross and make five and you could tally. But it's really hard to do that while you're up and going around and teaching. So there are other things we use. These counters. They fit right in your hand, palm of your hand. They've got a little lever on them. And as you're doing, when the thing happens, you squeeze your palm. I can teach, I can talk, I can call on people. And at the end of a period of time, I can look on this and it'll tell me exactly how many times it happened. I can teach anything exactly the way I would without this and use this and collect data. It absolutely doesn't have any difference for what I'm doing. If you don't want to hold something in your hand, what I've seen other people do for tallies is they'll fill their pocket with paper clips during a lesson. And every time the behavior happens, they'll pull a paper clip out and put it in the other pocket. At the end of the lesson, pull it out and see how many times it happened. I've seen people in Eugene, Oregon, and I don't think this would maybe work in many other places, wear these leather belts with beads on them and move these beads over. Um, but basically, all you're doing is counting. What's the simplest way you could possibly count? That's all we're looking for. So when we do this tally method, it's the most direct method we know of. Nothing's more direct than looking right at the kid and saying, there it is. Here's my tally, here's my mark, here's my click, here's, my, here's exactly how many times it happened. It's the most direct, but the problem with it is, it's really time consuming for you. 
Because if you want to know what's happening with that child over there and you're working with this kid, you're not getting what's going on over there. So if I really want to know what's going on with that kid, I have to constantly be looking that way. Great, great direct method. Hard to use because you have to look at the kid the entire time. And anything that makes you look at the kid the entire time isn't going to be useful in a lot of situations. So what we want to do is, <laughs> we want to go on and think about other things. But if you're going to use this, here's a simple one if you put it on paper. Now where did I get these tally marks? I could have written them on there as we go. Or at the end of every period, I could take them off of this. Or at the end of every period, I could pull out those paper clips. I don't really need to make tallies in that case. I can just go right to the number. But at some point, I'm recording my data onto a sheet. Now I can say, if somebody says, how's that going for that kid with whatever that is? And this one's talk outs. How's it going? It's getting worse. In this morning, how's it going over the last week? Well, I don't want to pull out all these data sheets over the weeks and try to sort through. So what I should do every day is I should take these numbers and put them on a graph. Then it's really simple. How's he doing? Look at the graph and it'll say exactly. Getting better, not getting better, getting worse. We could look at it that way. The other problem we have with anything that involves a tally is they don't work very well for behaviors that are lengthy. Give you an example. Here data for the number of times that Percy was out of his seat. So let's look at day one. He was out of his seat four times. Day two, Percy was out of his seat three times. And day three, Percy was out of his seat only once. Is it getting better for Percy? <laughs> because out of seat does not always occur for the same length of time, tallies don't work very well. Because here's what we know. If you looked at the duration, day one, four times out of his seat only lasted for a minute. But day three, out of his seat only once, but it was for over four hours. So if you look at the data by duration, it looks a lot different. So you can never use tally type methods, tallying using the clicker, using the beads, using the paper clips. You can never use tally if the behaviors you're looking at aren't basically equal in the amount of time they take up. So hand raises is a great one because it's a discrete behavior. Talkouts, usually pretty good. On task, not good for frequency tallies because on and off task are things that have varying durations. If we have things that have varying durations, we should use duration recording. Duration recording is pretty simple, although I very rarely use it because I think it's time consuming. Duration recording means that I carry, instead of this clicker, I carry a stopwatch. And when I see the behavior start, I click the stopwatch. And when I see the behavior stop, I stop the stopwatch. And when I see it start again, I start the stopwatch. And when I see it stop again, I stop the stopwatch. And at the end of that period of time, I go over to my recording sheet and I write down a time. It was this much. I could then do some division by the total amount of time I watched and get a percentage if I wanted to. That kid had been out of his seat 80% of the period because we were there for an hour and 48 minutes of that on my stopwatch, 48 minutes, he was out of seat. So that would be simple to use it that way. If I th generally think, if I need to use duration, I would probably go to a time-based system rather than duration. Duration is not a time-based system. Because what tells you when to use your stopwatch? <coughs> Behavior. It's an event-based system. So just because we're using a watch doesn't make it a time-based system. A time-based system is when time tells you when to record. The stopwatch doesn't tell you when to record, it does your recording. I think we could do it simpler. I don't use duration very often. 
unless it's something that's really long and I'm there with a watch and it would be easy to do, which is not very often that I'm somewhere where a watch is simple to use. Um, this is just another example of the same kind of thing. You can also do an average. If what you did was every time the clock, you said it stopped, you looked at the watch and wrote down that time and then reset the watch, then you could get an average. That's really time consuming. Now, if that's what you want, that's what you'd have to do. But while you're teaching, that just probably isn't a very effective way of doing it. We have some other ones. So uh, Miss Patient is concerned that Mr. Droop is taking far too long to deliver data on Susie once a request has been made. She complained to the principal who asked her the length of Mr. Droop's tardiness. Here we're collecting data on a faculty member, which I don't recommend. But um, <laughs> what, the, what they want to know is, how long does it take between the time we ask something and the time it gets done? That's known as latency recording, and it works just like duration recording, except you always start your watch when you behave. So I'm the teacher. Get out your books. Start your stopwatch. When do you stop your stopwatch? When book is out the way you want it to be. So the difference between duration recording and latency is, duration recording, you start and stop the watch based on what the kid does. <coughs> In latency recording, you start the watch based on what you do and stop it based upon what they do. Once they get their book out, you stop the watch, set it down, and we don't need it again. You go back when the whole lesson's over and say, so how long did it take them today? So that one's pretty simple. I would use the stopwatch in my classroom for latency if that was my issue. If it was duration, I probably would go to a different system, and I'll show you in a few minutes. So if we're using latency, these are our issues. <clears throat> it's really good for those quick stimulus response things. Everybody pair up. How long does it take them to do it? Turn in your homework. How long does it take before they do it? I want you to come in the room and go straight to your seat. So I would start the room, actually on that one, I would start the watch when they walk through the, through the door and stop it when they finally got into their seat. But on each one of those, it's a specific thing. The problem is, if I say I want you to come in and sit in your seat, then I've got that watch running and I have to watch that kid constantly until they do. Probably not that big a deal with something like stay in seat because I would know when they finally got there. I don't need to stare at them. But other things would require me to really focus on one kid for a long time, and I've got this whole other class I've got to deal with. So anytime it's going to make me stare at one kid, I'm probably going to say this doesn't, isn't going to work very well for me. This would be an example of a typical response latency thing. What do we want? Begins work upon request. So I start the watch when I say, hey, get busy. And I stop the watch when they get busy. Pretty simple. Not as simple as permanent product. Jane has been doing worksheets on her own to gain fluency with her addition skills. Miss Blinder wants to monitor her accuracy but can't watch her all the time. So we've got a fluency issue. I want you to be able to do this quickly on your own. But I can't stand there and watch you all day to see how quickly you're doing it. What are some of the ways that we monitor things academically? with permanent products, worksheets. That's our big permanent product for academics. Unfortunately, there are no, well, maybe it's fortunately, there are no worksheets for behavior. So we can't just have them do a worksheet and say, yes, their peer relations are much better because their scores on the worksheets are really good. That doesn't work for us very well. So what we do, though, is we say, <clears throat> is there some outcome we could look for? Is there something we could say? Maybe we could say, at the end of every day, we're going to take a look and see if Johnny is playing with other kids, and that will be our product. We'll take a picture of it. There's Johnny playing with other kids at the end of recess. Now, what would be my data later when I want to go look it up? The picture is my data. So anything that results in a permanent thing you can use which is generally something they write on paper, a picture. If you can videotape it, that counts as a permanent product, but you're gonna have to go back later and watch that videotape 
and that's time consuming. Now anything that takes extra time, I'm probably gonna stay away from, because I don't have a lot of extra time, I know you don't. So the advantage is, it's really easy. Hey, set them up somewhere and have them do something and bring back some sort of a product. The disadvantage, I don't really know what they were doing to get that. So I'm interested in this, does this kid hang out with other kids at the end of recess? Did they make friends during recess? And so I go at the end of recess and take my picture. Yes, he did. What I don't know is that he's, having, he's friends with them because he's threatened all of them. Other words. <laughs> or he's friends with them because he was smoking and they think that's cool. Or I don't know why they're friends. All I know is the snapshot at the end. It's like the kid, if you gave him the worksheet and said, go in another room and do it and bring it back. I can judge that worksheet, but I really don't know what happened when they were in that other room. Maybe somebody else did it for them. So it's good sometimes, but the permanent product things are hard to find for behaviors. Very hard to find. I guess you could say something like, anytime he plays with another kid and at the end that other kid does not have a bruise, there's my permanent product. <laughs> but I just don't think it's very logical that permanent product would work for us for behavior. It doesn't seem to me like there are many applications for it. So <clears throat> we could have this. It's a writing thing. I just can't think of a good one for behavior. <clears throat> This is my favorite. I use this one more than any other that I do when I go out and work with looking at kids in schools. <coughs> Felicity's been shouting out answers to questions posed by Mr. Query. Mr. Query has talked with Felicity and wants to monitor the number of times she raises her hand to answer a question. Here's the problem though. Here's what people will do. They'll just simply say, how many times did Felicity raise her hand for a question today? The problem is, how many times did you ask a question today? If you only asked one question and she raised her hand for it, she's doing really well. Tomorrow, if you ask 100 questions and she raises her hand 50 times, she's really not doing very well. But if you just looked at tally numbers, you'd say day two was better. So instead of looking at tallies, what we have to do is look at the percent of time she did it given an opportunity. Sounds complicated, it's not. I use this constantly with my kids when I worked in self-contained settings. I'd put a piece of masking tape on my forearm. I would then go about what I was gonna do. And let's say I was looking for a kid who was yelling out. I would consider every time I ask a question to be an opportunity for hand raising. Or, for those kids that just yell out even when it's not a question, I would say every time they yelled out was an opportunity to raise their hand that they blew. So every time a kid yells out, I put a zero on my masking tape. Opportunity blown. Every time that kid raises their hand, opportunity done well, I put a plus. And yes, the other kids say, why are you writing on your arm? And I said, I'm just keeping track of something. They very quickly habituate to that and don't pay attention to it because I did it every day anyway. So all I do at the end of the period then is rip that masking tape off and stick it on my desk somewhere. There's my data collection. Now what I can do later is I go back in. <clears throat> I go back in and I add up all of the pluses and I divide by all of the pluses and zeros together. And what it gives me is the percentage of opportunities in which that was done correctly. Now all I have to do is every day, whenever that setting is, and let's say it's during independent work times, then every day during independent work times with Felicity, I put that tape on and collect. The other thing I want you to really consider is Data collection doesn't necessarily need to happen with every kid every day. With a kid like Felicity, I might grab a sample of her behavior three times a week. And during independent work time on the other two days, I might be grabbing data on another kid. So it would be super great if you could watch that kid absolutely every minute of the week to collect everything there is. But that isn't always possible. So what kind of a sample <coughs> Is it possible for us to grab that would be something we could actually use? 
So, it's an event recording we record when behavior happens. <clears throat> the advantage is it allows us to account for the fact that sometimes you have opportunities and sometimes you don't. So on days when I'm asking questions, I could count the questions as the opportunity and say, is he or she raising their hand? Um, the disadvantage here, it still requires you to be looking at that kid all the time or paying attention to that kid all the time. And under some circumstances, that will be too much. This one minimizes that in some respects because you only really need to watch that kid when the opportunity presents itself. But sometimes those opportunities present themselves a whole lot. If you were actually going to put, put this on a sheet and use this, now when I go in and do research and I use control presentation, I sit in the back of the room and I do it like this. But you don't carry something like that around. And when I was teaching, I didn't. When I was teaching, I used the masking tape. But basically, it's the same thing. These are my marks of what happened. So these are opportunities. Where's my directions? Note the time again to observe for each student. Another student initiates a social interaction with a peer. Make a tally mark in the box. OK, so the circle one was a good one. So there's four opportunities to have a good peer interaction, and they did it right on one of them. So 25% of opportunities. <clears throat> all of those are pretty simple. But they all have one disadvantage. They require you to do a lot of watching. If you want to minimize the watching part, we can go to time-based. Time-based, we only record when a time has elapsed. When I used to use time-based when I was teaching, we had a clock that buzzed every 40 minutes, and that's when kids got up and did stuff. So I just let that be my time interval. That's a long time <laughs> interval. The longer that interval, the less accurate your data will be. High frequency behaviors with an interval that big, it's not gonna work. But if you've got low frequency behaviors, things like yelling, screaming, and let's say that doesn't happen all day long, but that maybe just once or twice a day, then 40 minutes is not bad. But if you got something that happens every 10 minutes, then you're gonna say, did it happen every 40 minutes? So you're gonna have 100% every time, it's not gonna tell you anything. So what we've gotta do is we gotta figure out which one makes sense for us. <coughs> When you use time-based, you've got to realize you don't have an accurate reflection of what happened. You have an estimate. What we have to decide is how close could we get and still make this realistic. If you used five-second intervals, you could be really, really accurate. But writing yes or no every five seconds would not save you any time over doing a tally, so I would not use that. Almost all of the research you see published out there on kids in classrooms is done with partial interval systems. I have done, I can't even tell you how many months I've spent sitting in classrooms coding every six seconds what a kid did. You don't want to do that. I don't think you think you will make a time-based method good for you unless you can make it at least a five-minute interval. Probably more like 15. But Let's talk about different ways to do it. Mr. Blunt wants to monitor Toby's pouting behavior so that she can have data for an IEP goal. She observed pouting episodes of varying durations at times throughout the day, but she just doesn't have time to monitor it with a watch. So she can't go out there and say, how long is this lasting? He pout oh, she he's pouting again. Oh, there the pouting stopped. Oh, there it starts again. And there it's I just don't have time to go all day with a watch looking at this. What can I do? Well, we could do something called partial interval recording. A partial interval recording means this. Figure out your period of time. Let's say it's 15 minutes. And let's say you're fancy and you've got some sort of a signal. Now, I've seen people put those, those little things that go on the board, that's a clock a timer that signals you every so often, and I've seen people use the vibrating wristbands, and I've seen people use the clock on the wall, or just set an egg timer, or whatever. But let's say every 15 minutes we're gonna record for Toby, did Toby pout at any time during that interval? 
So I set my clock and I say, go, okay, class, how are we gonna do today? We're doing arena. I look over and Toby's pouting. I don't need to look at Toby again for the next 15 minutes. Because, not that I, I'm not saying I won't, I'm just saying I don't have to. Because I know that when the bell rings at the end of 15 minutes, I'm gonna say yes, pouting occurred. So as soon as I see it, I don't need to think about it again. But then at 15 minutes, let's say the vibrates on my wrist, bzzz, on my wrist, and I go and somewhere I put a plus. Now that could be on my arm, that could be at my desk, it could be at the board, it could be something somewhere I go over in a little box, I put a plus. I go back about my teaching. And I'm teaching and I don't see any pouting and I'm teaching and I'm teaching and I see pouting and all I do when I see the pouting is I think to myself, I know what I'm gonna be putting the next time that bell rings. Now you can see that what I'm getting is not completely accurate. If he pouted for one second out of 15 minutes, I put a plus. So I'm gonna put a plus even if it happened for one second. The question asked, I ask myself at the end of that vibrating is, did Toby pout at any time during that last 15 minutes? If the answer is yes, I put a plus. If the answer is no, I put a zero. Now what I wanna do at the end of this is, <clears throat> I wanna add up all the pluses and divide by total number of intervals that I observed him. So if I observed for eight intervals and he had two pluses, I'm gonna say, Toby typically pouts during 25% of intervals observed. Now, what I want to know is, will that get better over time? Or does it get worse over time? And the only way to do this, I continue to use those 15 minute things every day. And yes, in one day, probably not real accurate. But multiple days over time being graphed, not bad. If your intervals are really long, less accurate. So if I said my intervals is a full day, if Toby pouts even once all day, I put a plus. Well, if Toby's pouting a lot, he's gonna get 100% every time and I'm not really measuring anything. So you've gotta figure out how short would my interval have to be for me to make this be accurate enough. And if my interval was gonna be that short, then wouldn't I be better off using something other than time-based? Yes. If what you're looking at is, is kid off task. If they're off task all the time, you don't want to be doing this. Find a simpler way. If it's something that they only do three, four times a day, then this is something that could really be useful. <clears throat> the advantage, it's good with behaviors that don't happen a lot. It will overestimate. <clears throat> it has a tendency to overestimate. So with low rate behaviors, it overestimates, but it makes you have something to count so that you can really look at progress over time. But if it's a high rate behavior, it's not gonna be sensitive. You're gonna say, hey, they went from 100 to 100, and it's not gonna tell you anything. So if you've got a behavior that you see kids doing, but it only happens rarely, fighting is a great one. Now, when you define fighting as using racial slurs, using verbal threats, or physically harming somebody, and it happens a couple times a week usually, then put a time-based system in place because it'll be really simple to use. Actually, in, under those circumstances, a tally probably would also work just as well. But if something's happening, usually we like to use these with things that are more continuous, where tallies won't work, so out of seat. So I don't need to get my stopwatch out. I'll use this. Your best substitution for your event-based is from duration. Duration's too hard to use, let's use this. So this is where it would make sense. The disadvantage of this, of course, is that it overestimates. If you were gonna just plot this on a sheet, and this is what myself, my research assistants, doc students, and everybody that are out in schools. We have pages with 50 rows of these things, and we have a little Walkman tape recorder with a looped tape that beeps every six seconds. And we literally sit there for hours, and every six seconds put a plus or a zero. It's really fun. I'm sure you'd enjoy it if anybody ever wants to volunteer. <laughs> but what we get is, during what percent of intervals did that behavior happen? 
the reason we use it is because it's far more accurate than anything else we do. We can get reliability on it. The other way to do this is called momentary sampling. Momentary interval. The momentary one, Mr. Blunt wants to monitor Toby's pouting behavior so that she can Ms. Blunt, so that she can have data for an IEP goal. She doesn't have time to constantly monitor Toby, although she sees pouting behavior often when she does look. Here's what momentary does. And this is the easiest one to use, and it's good for um, this one particular one, I'll try to say this the right way. Partial interval is good for low rates, things that happen infrequently. This is good for things that happen a lot, high rate, high frequency. We record at the end of an interval if the behavior is happening right then. So this is the simplest one. I go about my business, do my teaching, my vibrator thing goes off on my wrist and that signals me, look at that kid right now. Are they doing it? If yes, put a plus. If no, put a zero. Go back about your teaching. Do what you're doing. Talk to these people over here. I haven't looked over there for the entire 15 minutes. Bzzz, it's buzzing for me 15 minutes. Plus or zero. Go back to doing this. I don't have to look at all except for when the timer tells me to. Momentary time sampling is great for really high rate behaviors. For low rate behaviors, ones that only happen three or four times a day, if it's not happening right on your bzzz, you're not going to get it and you're going to show zero every day. So this one is really only good if you've got a behavior that happens a lot. This is one that we use a lot when we're in rooms that have a lot of kids with autism that do things like hand flapping or other behaviors that happen frequently for periods of time because what we have to do is when that beeps we look and see is it happening right now. It happens so often that we do catch a pretty good piece of it doing it that way. Is it exact? No, it's an estimate. An estimate for one day doesn't do us any good but estimates every day over time will still tell us about patterns and that's what we're looking for. So. Long or variable durations, doesn't matter. What we'd like to have is short intervals. How short could that interval be and still have it be reasonable for you as the teacher? How short could you get that interval? Remember, the longer it is, the more you miss. So I want to know, is that kid on task? Yeah, they're on task a lot, so this is a good one. It's a high rate behavior. Let's use this. So I'm over here talking to this person while this kid over here beats the crap out of somebody and then blood is spilled on the floor, starts a fire, the, the glass breaks, the sirens come, the fire alarm's going off, they come in, a SWAT team comes in and cleans up the whole mess, they beat him up and throw him back in his chair and then my vibrator goes and I look and, looking good over there. That's what you'd have to put. If you'd observe this whole thing and that kid was sitting in his chair on task again when your vibrator beeped, you would have to say, great job. You can't say, but it was a bad thing in the middle, so you have to stick by your rule. Remember, though, that when you're doing momentary, you are only capturing an estimate. So you always have to think, there's always, on every one of these methods, a trade-off between, that would really be simple, but it's not really accurate. I would love that one, it would give me really good data but I don't have time to do that. Where's your happy medium? So it's a consideration of what would collect the kind of data I want, what would be simple enough to do it, and what makes sense. So pull all that together. So here's what I'd like you to do. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes, and in that couple of minutes, I want you to get with a partner, and I want you to identify a behavior it can either be a behavior of mine or a behavior of hers, depending on who you want to look at. I want you to sit with your partner. I want you to think about what that behavior is. And I want you to come up with an event-based measure. So you're either going to tally it, or you're going to use a stopwatch, or you're going to do opportunities. 
I think you're probably going to tally it. So why don't we just say you're going to tally it. I want you to think of what that behavior would be. Get a good definition. Because what we're going to ask later is, did you guys agree? And if you don't have a good definition, you're going to go, well, I thought you meant this. No, I thought we were talking about that. So do that before. I'm going to talk about something for five minutes and give you a chance to do that. And then I'm going to switch and have you do a time-based one. And I'm going to talk for another five minutes. And I'm going to have you compare which ones you think work best and simplest. So get with your partner, identify a behavior, and, and get your little plan ready for five minutes. <laughs> data collection jump into well, that would be another behavioral objectives, you're going to be collecting data on whatever it is you're collecting data on while you're also listening to this, hopefully. So, <laughs> are, we, are we like one, two, three, start? Or how yeah, we'll say one, two, three, start. Yeah, we'll you start want to do the tally? Sure. So, tally. so what we're going to do is we're going to do this for five minutes. Oh, we have different you're, going to, you're going to do that and this at the same time. Then we're going to stop. I'm going to give you a chance to think about it just a little bit. I'm going to have you turn it into a time-based system. I'm going to talk for five more minutes, and then we'll compare. We'll have a discussion about the two pieces together. OK, so um, <laughs> Sherry, will you stop us at the end of five minutes? Yes, I will. All right, begin. OK, I want to hit on objectives. If there's one thing in dealing with prospective teachers for the last 15 years that I've found is that they don't like writing objectives and when they get into schools they continue to not like writing objectives and don't do them very well. So we, I started this out when my first job was going around and monitoring IEPs and I kept finding these IEPs with the objectives, student will be better by end of year. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, people aren't doing a very good job of writing objectives. So I started trying to teach it better when I taught uh, undergrad classes in special ed. And this five minute version of what we need to do. One, objectives have to have four things to be legal. If you are taken to court by an attorney and you don't have those four things, you are going to lose. Objectives must have a person. They have to be personalized for a student. It is technically illegal just to have a bank of goals and say they all have to come out of the bank. It has to be about a person. Two, you must have an operational definition of a behavior in there. It can't say we'll get better because that's not a behavior. We'll do this. We'll do that. What will they do? Third, a criterion. How much of that should they do in order for us to say this is good enough? They must do this behavior five times. They must do this behavior at 80% by the end of a week. We must have a criterion for it to be legal. If it's not measurable, it's not legal. And lastly, when will you measure this? You're making a big mistake if you write a behavioral objective and don't put in the condition, not only because it's not legal, but when you don't put condition, what you're really saying is, I will measure this 24 seven no matter where that kid goes. And you don't want to do that. You want to say, I will measure this during independent work times in math class. Put a condition on there, which tells when we're going to measure it. Without a condition, you have, and remember, an IEP is a legally binding contract. Without a condition, you have said, I will monitor this everywhere all the time. And I'm guessing you're not. So we need a condition. Here are some helpful hints for building good objectives. The main verb should be observable. Get better is not observable. Student will throw objects. Student will raise hand. Student will, student will feel better. Not observable. Legally, can't work because you can't measure that on a regular basis. Student will feel better as indicated by response on a sheet. Yes, you could do that. Because the, what you're really saying is response on a sheet is what I'm measuring. So it must be measurable. <clears throat> be sure that the criterion matches the behavior. 
What that means is you can't say student will raise his hand with 80% accuracy because that doesn't mean anything. We want student will raise his hand 80% of opportunities. Student will finish a worksheet with 80% accuracy. But if you say they're going to do something that's this and then the criterion is something completely different, it's unmeasurable which means it's illegal and someone could sue and say that you're not doing what you're supposed to do legally under IDEA and they would win. Be sure that the conditions are replicable. If you're going to say we're going to measure that whenever that kid in the blue shirt hits him, blah 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 blah, that's not going to be replicable. Say whenever someone hits him. Make it something that you can actually measure. If you make those conditions really tight, you'll never be able to measure it. Be sure the conditions are clear and make sense. When will you measure? What is an independent work time? <clears throat> Be sure that you can measure your criteria. Here's a big, big mistake people make. They write a big, beautiful objective and then say, I can't measure that. <laughs> what you should do is first say, how could I measure that? And then use that for your criteria. So if you said, I'm going to measure tally, then put in here number of times for your criteria. If you said, I'm going to measure using controlled presentation. Is that five minutes? Okay, just stop observing right there and let me finish this and then we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, be sure that the objective is stated positively. Don't say student will not. You couldn't do that for reading or math. Student will not get answers wrong. <laughs> student will not, you would say student will do this. A behavioral objective is what we're teaching. So what do you want them to do? Be sure that the baseline rates are used to set your criteria. If the kid's doing it zero now, do not write an objective that says 100%. <laughs> write one that you can achieve. And get rid of the filler words. Student will be able to. What do you, how do we know they're able to unless they do it? So get rid of the will be able to. Student will do this. Student will be able to raise hand. Well, they're able to raise their hand now. Are they doing it? So don't say student will be able to. Student will demonstrate. Student, just say student will, and then put the behavior. All the other stuff is just makes them longer. OK, stop. I want you to get with your partner, and I want you to look at your number of tallies and their number of tallies and see if they're the same. If they're not the same, I want you to divide the small number by the big number to get your reliability. So take a couple minutes and do that. Less than 80. Not raising your hand very high over here. Less than 80. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't want to know what the behaviors were. Yeah. Um, was it difficult at all? <coughs> Probably not as difficult for you as it would be if you had a task in front of you. Now, when I do this with my graduate students and they're all busily taking notes, they hate it. Yeah. You don't have to take notes. You don't really have to listen. So, <laughs> not that hard. But if you had to do something else right now, this gets hard. Let's do it again. I want you to use your same behavior, same definition. This time, Sherry's going to signal. Sherry, if you would just yell out time every one minute. And if you can just signal them the time. Signal them the time every, every one minute. You're to make no marks on your paper until you hear the minutes, the time sign signal. At the, every time she makes a time signal, and there will be five total, you will write down on your paper a plus or a zero. They need to be in order, so make five little boxes somewhere on your paper. Which method are we using? Does it I'll tell you in a second. OK, okay so every minute, you're going to hear a time signal. You, at that point, should look down and make a mark. Do not make a mark on your paper before that signal. Here's why. Because, this has happened to me more than once, 
I think, oh, I'm going to put a plus on that next one. I'll just go ahead and do it now. And then, no, 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 I'm daydreaming. And then the signal goes off, and I think, did I already write that or not? And then I'm off. So don't put it until the time goes off. OK, you're going to be using partial interval, which means if I did it at all, you're going to write it down. OK? So if you're looking at a high rate behavior, you're going to get a really high rate on here. If you're looking at a low rate behavior, in fact, you can go ahead and use, wait a minute. If you're looking at a high rate, why don't you use momentary? If you had one that happened a ton of times last time. If you have one that happens rarely, then use partial. Okay, either way, you only make a mark at the end. With momentary, you're only making a mark if I'm doing it right when she says time, when the signal comes. You look confused. <laughs> Say all of that again. Okay, if last time when you were doing tallies, you had a whole bunch of tallies, then this time I want you to do momentary, which means you're only going to make a mark if it happens right when she says time. If last time you only had like two or three tallies, then this time you should use partial interval, where you make a plus at the end of the interval if it happened at all, anywhere in there. Okay? All right, so you're all using a time-based system now. My behavior isn't signaling you to make a mark. The timer is. And I'm going to continue on. We're going to do some practice with objectives. So I want you, while we're doing this, to be thinking about that. Ready, Sherry? Uh, when my <coughs> minute changes, I'll shout start. I'll try not to behave until then. Okay, let's do a little practice. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some objectives that are not very good. They're not real objectives. I've made them up. And, but some of them are made up off of things that I've actually seen very similar pieces to. Daryl will distinguish lunch line and bathroom line 18 out of 25 days. <laughs> what are some problems?